gives us free. Us free. Your Honor, please instruct the defendant that he cannot disrupt these proceedings with such a. Give us a free! Give us a free! If we are to have any semblance of order in this give us a free! Unity and welcome my conscious and unconscious family and friends. This is the all new Black Village Community Podcast, and I am truly your host of the show, JC, aka Afro Black, dropping nothing but the raw and uncut. Without any fear, as I use my mic as a spear to chuck a chuck of you with liberated truth, I am your host and your native soldier in the struggle. My purpose and mission for this show is first to enlighten, inform, and engage. And I want to engage with all who claim to know the truth. All truth seekers and my native family, I welcome you. This show is dedicated to all our indigenous native ancestors and to all those who've carried the mantle of truth and to every person with the ability to throw off the chains of comfortable habit and unwarranted assumption and move in a new, liberated direction that is guided by truth and observational evidence, no matter where that direction may lead you. My main objective and purpose here is freedom, mind, soul, and spirit. That being said, welcome to the Black Village Community Podcast and much love from our great universal goddess and mother of all living here and above. Talk about guns and the drugs, pretty serious. But look at what they feeding y'all. That's what's really killing us. Please change the food in my school, make it good. Get that fake food up out of my hood. Hope the message not misunderstood. Grow and cook your own food, yes you could. Got the little homies in the garden. Got the big homies selling collard greens in the north side. Ain't starving since community cooks been on the scene. Screaming hot Cheetos and Takis, boy you better eat your broccoli. Fake food is kind of lame. Poison in your brain, be more people at the club, popping bottles of that water, dabbing on that fast food, pulling veggies out the garden, I go hard, I eat good, and I put that on my mama, eating healthy school lunch, and that's where the Miss Obama, drinking water, living longer, no process drama, call me John Deere, shawty, I be growing like a farmer, dad. Freedom, 
Hey, 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 this is JC, aka Afro Black, and I am here with ya for another delicious indigenous Sunday to kick back and drop the raw and uncut with my indigenous family. You feel me? I am here. I am back. This is JC, aka Afro Black, and I am aboriginally black with my people to drop the raw and uncut and to share nothing but the raw and uncut with the conscious and those who are on a journey to be conscious and maybe those who don't even know nothing about this you feel me if you want to chime in if you want to join me if you want to if you just want to come just listen in it's all gravy and potatoes you can chime in it doesn't cost you a dime just a bit of your your conscious time you can chime in at 857-232-0155 again that is 857 area code and 232-0155 and don't forget the conference key to get to the conference though so you can sit with me at the indigenous table of truth you feel me here on the black village that conference code is nine four seven five nine five again that is nine four seven five nine five conference code if you want to join me here on live on the show the black village you hear me so today's podcast topic is and i quote why we eat the way we do again podcast topic this delicious sunday on the 29th of July is why we eat the way we do subtitled the plantation poisoning of a people you feel me so this is a part three a continuation from last week and the week before last with just a little subtle shift in the podcast topic itself you feel me because I'm breaking this down for my people to share the conscious truth historical truth you feel me of what went on and what's going on with us today and why we eat the way we do and did our ancestors eat healthy? Were they eating healthy on the plantation or were they eating unhealthy on the plantation? Did they eat unhealthy because they didn't know any different or was it because of their oppressors? You feel me? We're going to discuss that today and some other things as well. I got some audio casts I want to play, but before I go into any further, let me change my tune and give us something more laid back to, to vibrate to something like uh, this here. Again, like I love it, you know, Black Cotton by Tupac. And that Pac, I mean, excuse me, that intro to my show that you heard, that that rap intro, that, that song that you heard, was by a group and an organization called, um, the name of the song is Grow Food, okay? And the name of the organization is Appetite for Life. Appetite for Life, you feel me? Basically, it's an organization that's trying to help uh, you know, aka so called black folks eat more healthy. You feel me? So that song was called Grow Food, and it was by a young youth group that's a part of the organization called Appetite for Life. I love the song. The song is definitely in reference to what we're going to be talking about today why we eat the way we do. And what do I mean by why we eat the way we do? We got a lot of uh, so called black folks in America. And you know what? They got us on the index list as at as the worst ethnic group or ethnic group of a people in America to eat next to Latinos as far as obesity and eating unhealthy. And there's a lot of factors that factor in on why so-called black people eat so unhealthy. And some of the things we I mean, I'm pretty sure my listeners and you guys have heard before, you know, not act you know, not having enough access to healthy foods, not having uh, you know, um, farmers markets are uh, fresh fruits and vegetables uh, in the stores and accessible and, 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 and you know, and, and uh, price, you know, costly where we can afford fresh fruit, fruits and vegetables. They don't make these things accessible in the urban communities. You know, even there's supermarkets in their stores, but as far as fruits and vegetables, you know, being at a decent price so you can provide those fruits and vegetables for your children and your family. And the fact that having just good, healthy, and a good variety of health, fruits and vegetables is, is, is commonplace that that's not something that's sitting in the urban communities for so-called black and brown families to have access to. And then we got to take into consideration the way we prepare our food. You feel me? So I got the, I got I got some audio cast that's going to speak to that and, and to what we're talking about today. And I'm, I'm going to share that as well. So, um... We're going to verbrate on some of these, some of this information today. I think it's really important, especially when it comes to talking about the truth of how our people ate and, 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 you know, um, uh, the indigenous Aborigine people of America, the way they ate, uh, the fact that they 
were farmers and agriculturalists and the fact that they ended up on a lot of them ended up prisoners of wars prisoners of wars on plantations ran by European Americans with the purpose of getting as much work ethic out of them as possible without uh, you know not being considerate of the fact of you know how these people ate but forcing their own assimilation of eating their own uh, uh, European practices of eating on our people on the plantation you feel me also last week last week I was talking about you know, making you know making a reference to last week's podcast topic, which was titled "The Plantation Poison of a People," with the subtitle being "Why We Eat the Way We Do." In reference to last week and the week before last, I talked about um, the lead poisoning of Flint, Michigan, and the lead poisoning of what's going on in Chicago. Mind you, both these both these places are in the vicinity and the state of Michigan. You feel me? Um, and I made reference to the fact last week that. The original indigenous people of Chicago and the, even the state of Michigan itself were a number of indigenous aboriginal tribes. The, Owa, the, uh, the Ottawa, the Ojibwa, the Chippewa, you feel me? The, Ellen, the, uh, the Illinois or Illinois Indians, you feel me? And there were hundreds of thousands of Indians in the, in, in, just in the region uh, of Illinois and when you talk about uh, Illinois and, and the state of Michigan itself and when you talk about that area that was a very large area okay and at one time most people don't even know that the state of Michigan was so called okay owned or c- under the control of the French up until 1717 so it was up until 1717 they handed it over to uh, the English speaking Europeans you feel me but prior to that, just looking at in reference of how large this place was and when it comes to uh, the state of Michigan, which covers an area of uh, from, let me see, uh, from the fr- from the province of Canada, okay, all the way down to what is called the French province of Louisiana and northeastern administrative border, somewhat vaguely near the Illinois River and the territory became which is now called which is as known as the upper Louisiana all that territory around that was Cohequia uh, Cohequia Indians uh, you know um, as well as uh, Pequot Indians I mean, hundreds of Indians lived in that vicinity which is called now called the state of Michigan all the way down to, to Chicago okay and what most people are not privy to is that from 1778 to 1871 they had ratified over 370 treaties just with the indigenous aboriginal Indians of Michigan just just all those Indians within the state of Michigan and when I say Michigan I'm talking about even the area of Chicago over from from 1778 to 1871 they had ratified over 370 treaties okay and they ended those treaties making treaties by 1871 with up with uh with with uh another additional 73 agreements that they didn't want to call treaties they called agreements that basically contained similar provisions and ratifications that they had in other in their other uh, so-called treaties that they constantly broke. So I just want to mention that. I want to mention that because last week I didn't get a chance to mention um, the 300, the over 370 treaties just in the state, just with the indigenous aboriginal Indians of the state of Michigan. And, you know, uh, I would encourage anybody to go back and go pull up some of those treaties and read some of those treaties and, you know, it's good information and good history information. Now, rolling this thing forward to today, which is the 29th of July, Sunday, which pop with the podcast topic of why we eat the way we do. OK, I wanted to talk about and I want to share with my indigenous community and those who aren't indigenous and anybody who's tuning into this show when it comes to why we eat the way we do. Number one, we got to we got to consider uh, three factors I want to bring up, or I call it three methods of assimilation and control that was done to our people. Okay, there were three main methods of controlling indigenous people here in America. And they still use this method 
in my opinion, throughout the world when it comes to dealing with indigenous people. There are three main methods of controlling indigenous people that are still being used and are in use today. The first being the total control and restraint of indigenous people themselves. Basically controlling the people, how they create laws to, to control us. Just like the, the black codes of the 1800s. You feel me? Then we're, then we're methods of controlling our people on down to the, uh, the slave laws. That was a way of controlling and restraining our people. Okay? To the second, which is total control and mastery over the land and resources by which we live. And the third being the final and the completion of assimilation by means of U.S. laws and legal paper genocide. Again, the third and final being the completion of a, the completion of assimilation by means of U.S. laws, corrupt U.S. laws, and legal paper genocide. Okay, so there are things we got to keep into consideration when you talk about why uh, so-called black folks eat the way they do today. You got to take into consideration they did these things to our indigenous ancestors before enslavement, just when they came over here in contact. And started co setting up their colonies, you feel me, w uh, calling themselves living in peace with our people, when in all reality, they were snatching up our people and making them slaves to work on their colonies, you feel me, okay? The three main methods they used to control our people, the first being control and restraining, the, the control and restraint of indigenous people. The second meaning the control and mastery over the land, over our land and resources, which they've done. And the final being, which is they still doing to this day, the completion of assimilation by means of U.S. laws and legal paper genocide. OK, so now let's roll this thing forward into the way we eat today. What, what does this have to do with the way we eat today? OK, number one, controlling and restraining our indigenous people. What did they do on the plantation? Once they took kept our people on these plantations, and as Brother Dane Calloway have said in many of his documentaries, that originally our people were prisoners of war. Prisoners of war. And in a lot of cases, our people ended up being stuck on plantations when they were actually had agreements to help these white people run their own farms, and then they kept our people on these farms as prisoners to work their plantation as slaves. Turn, as, basically, there they weren't farms; they were plantations that they had our people working, and they kept them. And then they created laws to keep our people on these plantations to work as free labor. You feel me? So that was the number one thing. And what do you think they do? Which is also another means of control and restraint: controlling how they ate, controlling what they ate, controlling when they ate. Okay. All right. Now, and then the second, which they kept into place, that also helped give our people bad habits okay controlling and the master and controlling over the land and resources when you control the land and the resources now you're controlling what i eat and how i eat and you're controlling what's in what i'm eating regardless if it's beneficial or not beneficial they had our people depending on them they had no choices on the plantations on what they ate and most people who know anything about the the stories of of slavery on the plantation OK, of course, I say that the, 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 the story of us coming on ships from Africa is a fictitious, manipulative, lying story. But the fact that they had indigenous aborigines on those plantations, running those plantations and working those plantations, that's the wrong uncut truth. And in the process of that, they was controlling the way our people ate and how they ate. OK, so let me continue this. All right. Um. And then, like I say, the, the paper genocide is still going on today. So now I have an, a, an article, I, uh, excuse me, not an article, but a book I want to read. This book is titled Native Peoples of North America by Dr. Susan Stebbins. And she's uh, a professor at the, at the State University of New York. OK, so this is a college textbook. It's called Native Peoples of Native Peoples of North America by Dr. Susan Stebbins from State University of New York. OK, this is un, this is uh, in the part that's in this book is under page two the, of her introduction under growing our own food. OK, now I'm, I want to point out that <clears throat> when these people came over here, OK, and they sat down and call themselves uh, being peaceful with our indigenous ancestors when they had other things in mind, like taking the land, 
like uh, creating war and, and, and trying to uh, exterminate our people. You feel me? There's some things you got to take into consideration. Our people were farmers. They were at the top of their profession in agriculture when it came to growing their own food. Okay, and so I want to share a piece out of, the, out of this woman's book, which is titled Native, Amer- Native Peoples of North America by Dr. Susan Step- Steppens from, the, from State University. And, it quote, and I quote, starting right here, in the Americas, a wide assortment of crops was grown, but not limited to potatoes, tomatoes, several varieties of beans, chilies and chocolate. Despite popular media image of Indians hunting bison at, on horseback, by the time of European contact, many, many Native Americans produced much of their own food through horticulture. Uh, through horticulture. The domestication of some plants while still foraging, fishing, and hunting. And agriculture. Societies in the South. Mesoamerica and most of the eastern and mid-eastern and southwestern parts of what is now the United States were prosperous horticultural they were prosperous horticultural and agricultural societies. Did you hear that people? Again, okay? She said, okay? She said many many Native Americans produced much of their own food through horticulture. Okay? The domestication of some plants while still foraging, fishing, and hunting. And agricultural societies. Societies in the South. Indian Indian societies in the South. So, uh, South America. Mesoamerica. Most of the eastern and midwestern and southwestern parts of, of, um, of what is now the United States were prosperous, horticultural, and agricultural societies. The original inhabitants of the Americas developed horticultural, agricultural, and a high level of technology, as well as ceremonial, spiritual, and expressive culture, the arts, without influence from Europe. Let me read that last part again. The technologies, talking about their technologies of horticulture and agriculture, they had a high level of technology as well as ceremonial, spiritual, and expressive culture, the arts, without influence from Europe. So our people already knew how to grow everything that was grown in here in this country in this country. Everything that was already that, that the white man discovered or think he discovered or clay claimed that he discovered was already discovered by our people and we had already our people had already mastered the growth of fruits and vegetables the horticulture as well as the agriculture of growing fruits and vegetables okay let me read uh, another part three of the same book native peoples of north america by susan dr susan stebbins okay uh this is under matriarchy I said this before and I've told our people before. Our people, our indigenous ancestors were a matriarchal people. They were a matriarchal people. Okay? So let me read this from her book. It says, There would have been dissimilarities between Native Americans and European societies as well. Religious beliefs and practices would have been different as well as expressive culture or what we call today as the arts. While in Europe, Asia, and and to a lesser extent, Africa, kin organizations became more centered around men, patrinal, or, uh, or patrinal, or patriarchal. Many Native American societies were matrilineal, or matrifocal, meaning they, meaning that their kin groups were descended from women. So inheritance, or or uh, usufruct rights went from mother to daughter, perhaps because of the important roles of women within kin groups and religious and religions within the society. They had held more important roles within the political system of many Native, Amer- Native American societies. Native American women also had very important roles within the, eco- the, uh, the economies of their society, both pr- producing and distributing important resources. Again, did you hear her? She said that our people were matrilocal and matrifocal and matrilineal. 
Oh, yeah, I'm going to read it again. She said, many Native American societies were matrilineal and matrifocal. She also, she didn't say matrilocal, but I'm going to say that as well. They were, they were matrilocal, matrifocal, and they were matrilineal. So, um, um, the special, specifically, and specifically Woodland Indian tribes. All Woodland Indian tribes were matri- matriarchal, matrilineal, matrifocal, and matrilocal, meaning everything was centered around the woman. The community, the, the indigenous community, the, to, from, the, from the communities to every tribe within the community was headed by clan mothers. Clan mothers. You feel me? They ran the communities. They made the rules in the communities. They were the healers. They were the spiritualists. And they were they the ones who did the cooking and they did the building. The men helped out with, helped out with some of the building. But the women, they, the women har, um, planted all the fruits and vegetables. And they did all the harvesting. They did all the cooking. As well as taking care of the children. And the women also made the rules and how and the, and the the rules within the communities, how the how the communities operated and ran were up under the supervision of the clan mothers. Again, our people are matrilineal and matrifocal centered, and that meant even their spiritual ways were under the guise of a female deity, not a male deity like you see a lot of these European. Uh, contaminated so-called reservational tribes today who call themselves Christians who've gotten away from their old ways. Okay? So, now you might be saying, what does all this have to do with the way we eat? I'm going to get down to that in just a minute. Let me read another paragraph right quick under chapter 3, which is Civilized Societies uh, by, again, Susan Stebbins in a book that she wrote called uh, Native Peoples of North America. Okay? Uh, let me start with chapter three. Yeah, Native peoples of North America. Okay. The histories and cultures of the indigenous peoples of the Americas are no less complex than those of Europe, Asia, or Africa. Euro Americans and Canadians, those people who are descended from immigrants from Europe to the North America, continue to hold many mistaken stereotypes about the, Colum- about the pre Columbian American Indians. For example, it is commonly believed that at the time of European contact, the Americas were vast, empty lands occupied by a few of the attributes associated with the civilization of Europe, such as growing their own food. The fact that the Americas were occupied by, she said, but, excuse me, the fact is that the Americas were occupied by millions of people, many of whom were farmers, and these people had achieved similar technological developments to people in Europe, except in one area, weapons. In other words, our people knew how to grow food, even domesticate animals better than Europeans. The only thing our white people did not have was weapons. The only thing our people did not have was the advanced technology of the gun are the canning ball. They didn't have those type of weapons. Our people, when it came to weapons, we had bows, we had arrows, we had spears, we had knives, but that was about it. We didn't make, we didn't have gunpowder, we didn't make guns, we didn't make cannons, we didn't make, you know, uh, Gatling guns. Our people didn't do things like that. And for one thing, life was sacred when it came to indigenous people. Life was sacred. You didn't just take somebody's life. If you took somebody's life, there had to be a balance. There had to be retribution. You have to balance it out. That's another podcast for another time. So, again, what does this all have to do with the way we eat? Number one, you got to realize our people did not just go into slavery like the what European just came in and was just rounding our people up and putting them into slave. There was many wars in America. Especially if you go look up the wars of the 17th and 18th century. Read, go check out those wars. There were many wars in the 18th and 1700s that our people had with the Europeans. It wasn't just, they didn't just come over and just put our people into slavery. But look what it just said. It says the only thing that they had over our people was weapons. These are the very weapons they used to enslave our people. Guns. Knives. Gatling guns. The, you know, and, 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 you know, the, uh, um, the six shooter, you feel me? These, they use these things to 
to they use them to have our people kill one another as well as they killed our people with these weapons but they use these weapons also in war to massacre our people by the thousands you feel me that's that's how the gun the advancement of the handgun the advancement of of the technology of um the of the handgun to the to the rifle was advanced here in America. It was not advanced in Europe. The technology of the handgun was advanced here in America at war with our people. From the Colt 45 to the gun that was before the Colt 45, which was the the Patterson, the the uh, uh, the, the the six shooter Patterson semi automatic handgun, which was which the Patterson was specifically created to kill Indians. So my point being is that there was not just no easy putting our people in slavery. They they were killing our people, shooting our people, lynching our people. You feel me? And that's how our people ended up stuck on these on these plantations and not being able to leave because they were forced. Now, when you get down to talking about the way our people ate now, realizing that our people was forced, forced to eat the food that they ate, forced to eat food they did not want to eat. You feel me? Now let's get down to talking about talking about more about the way our people ate. Okay. Okay. Today, talking about our people today, when we rewind this today into the present time, today we got we have more we black folks, so called black and brown people, are the only people on the planet with such bad eating habits today that it affect our children and it's affecting our health in a terrible way. But when you link this to what was going on on the plantation, I want you to know, most people don't know that they had our people eating so bad on the plantation that something that the Europeans had dealt with in Europe and on their ships when they were coming over here, which is called scurvy, ended up on the plantation affecting a lot of black people on the plantation. Now, I'm not sure if you know what scurvy is. Let me read to you what is what is scurvy okay uh scurvy is the name of a vitamin c deficiency it can lead to anemia debility exhaustion spontaneous bleeding pain in the limbs especially the legs swelling in some parts of the body and sometimes ulcerations of the gums and loss of teeth scurvy has been known as an as a scene in ancient Greek and Egyptian times, it is often associated with with the sailors in the 15th and 18th centuries when long sea voyages made it hard to get a steady supply of fresh produce. Many died from the effects of scurvy. Yes, people. And I want you to know scurvy eventually affected many indigenous people on the plantation. And the reason why is because they were giving our people mostly pork and beef leftover parts of the animal. The parts of the animal that the white man would not eat. Pig balls, what they call hog maws, pig ears, pig tongue, pig head, pig feet. Same thing when it came to the cow. They gave the slave the leftovers on the plantation. Yeah, the pig intestines, the cow intestines, cow tongue. Uh Uh-huh. And this is what the people had to eat. They had to make do with what they had. But think about it. You had a people who knew how to grow anything they wanted to grow. Knew mastered cultivation of agriculture. Mastered growing vegetation and fruits and vegetables. Now they're on a plantation and they cannot grow the things that they need to grow for their families anymore. Now they have to cook for the master. And they have to cook what he want to cook. They have to grow what he want to grow. And they can't do it for their families because they were prohibited from growing vegetation for their own families. Okay. Let me read something right here. Okay. Um, when it comes to, also, when it comes talking about the pig, okay. Uh, I want I got something I want to read right here. But before I read anything else any further, okay. Let me prove to you that our people were the indigenous Indians who knew how to who knew how to grow, who were masters at agriculture, masters at holy culture. To prove that, I got a clip I want to play right quick. And this is a clip of a brother. And this brother, he is a master chef, okay? 
and he basically every year goes out to the out to the south and they, out to the south where they reenact the civil war well he plays a role as a slave when he goes to these reenactments and he actually cooks actual food that they cooked on the plantation he cooks it um you know so let me let you let me let you guys check this out and we shall return cinnamon squash black eyed peas okra uh watermelon peanuts beans for chef michael twitty farm to table has a deeper meaning than for most twitty is a culinary historian who explores the complicated story of race culture and food and he's now the first revolutionary in residence at colonial williamsburg where visitors come to learn about and experience life in 18th century virginia Twitty takes part in the town's historic recreations, wearing the clothing of the enslaved people who once toiled here. This is the kind of garden that an enslaved person would have. Imagine this is not in a, a big period garden space. Yeah. Imagine that this is a space where this is behind your cabin or beside your this cabin. This is your little plot. This is your little plot in one place. And it's, you know, designed to be as fertile and as self-sustaining as possible. If you're working in a tobacco field sun to sun, the only time you can cultivate this garden is early dawn, twilight, and at night. The other thing that's noticeable here, of course, is these aren't like nice, neat rows. No, 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 no. Our ancestors would have won every single environmental award. I mean, they were organic, they were local, they were sustainable, uh, they practiced permaculture, they composted. Those are all modern labels, but they're already doing that here. It's an issue of people who are in exile adapting, adapting to where they are and figuring out how to make it work. Ancestry is a central theme in Twitty's new book, The Cooking Gene, a journey through African-American culinary history in the Old South. He addresses what he calls discomfort food in the legacy of the South, in part with visits to tobacco and cotton fields previously tended by the enslaved. At Williamsburg, he joined Ed Schultz in a display field. The Old South comprising slaveholding states takes central stage in Twitty's book, which weaves explorations of his own identity, including his conversion to Judaism, the roots of American food, and stories from his own childhood. The book you chose to write is also part memoir, right? Yeah. So why use your own story and your own family and to tell that story? I was always um, intrigued by this notion of the black autobiography. I mean, the kind of writing that, you know, my Angelo or James Baldwin did. Mm -hmm. You know, how I got over. Yeah. Um, how I... Um, came to be this person, that we have passions that last our whole lives and that we are extremely engaged in our own history and culture. Yeah, um, but you didn't start out that way, no, even by your own right, description, own right? Description. I didn't, I didn't, wasn't interested in soul food. I, was, I didn't even really like being black, I think right. you wrote. Right? Exactly. So I why suddenly like, explore all that? I wanted to re-approach the sort of narrative of self-critique and self-hatred but also letting people know that the food was my way in. Um, the stories, I got a sense of pride of the people who I came from, my own family. And I felt like I wanted to put the microscope on myself. And I wanted other people to not be afraid to, to also follow the blueprint and sort of really own every aspect of their identity. At Williamsburg, Twitty often works with fellow chef Harold Caldwell in this 18th century kitchen to bring history to life for visitors. Here, as in colonial times, the cooking fire burns even on the hottest days of summer. So who are you thinking of as you're cooking? My aunties. Right. You know, my great aunties. That's it. Um, Granddaddies at barbecue. Right, that's right, that's right. All the men who are in the kitchen, all my uncles cook. But when people just label them just slaves, yeah, they put them in a class like they, like they don't have a soul, like they're not human beings. Do you know the names of, the, of anybody we who do. cooked here? We know. There was 28 enslaved people. We know every name of every enslaved person that was on this property because of the inventory that they had. Yeah. Yeah. So we speak their name as, as, much as, as much as we as often as possible. We like to think of these folks as the founders of American cuisine. 
An amalgam of cultures is the quintessential American story, but when addressing American food, Twitty says certain people have been left out of the narrative. A lot of people aren't the argument, well, what is American food? And for some people, they'll blurt out fast food. For some people, they'll blurt out it's food from all over the world. Um, and then very rarely, it's someone will talk about the indigenous, the indigenous, as well as the naturalized foods and traditions. And so I want people to sort of include us in that conversation. And know that we've always been a part of it. We've always been a part of the narrative of creating American food, and always will be. Yeah, we, that's also part of the agency factor, that you own your emotions, you own your facts, you own your opinions, and you also understand how we got here and how you got here. There you go. You heard it. You heard it right there. And if you was listening to that um, that audio I just played, you heard that brother say, mention the fact that indigenous foods. He was telling you something. If you also heard him at the beginning of the audio, when I first played it, he was mentioning about how our ancestors would have won all the awards if they was if they was entering a uh, uh, you know a garden contest of growing of, of you know a farming our farming contest they would have won because they you know the the little bit of garden garden that they were allowed to grow on on the plantation for themselves they were only able to tend their own gardens in the twilight of the night because they were picking cotton or cultivating corn or sugar from sun up to sun down. So they only had to be able, they were only able to tend to their gardens at night. Let me also, uh, I want to read something right quick in reference to that. Now, the reason why I played that, if these guys were Africans on plantations, how were they able to grow such uh, you know, the type of things that they grew. Because I'm, I'm going I'm to read to the type of vegetation the slave grew on the plantation for himself. Also, let me also mention, prior to allowing slaves to grow their own vegetables on the plantation, before, before there was a time when they weren't, they weren't allowed to do that at all. They were only allowed to work the master's plantation, to work the master's crops. They changed that when they realized that the scurvy that they had experienced in Europe, the slave was getting the scurvy. And when slaves get scurvy, basically you cannot work if you have scurvy. You're not going to last long in a field working with scurvy. And so this is where they started allowing slaves to grow a little bit of their own vegetation. So beforehand, though, let me read this. Let me read this right quick. This is taken from... Uh, the Georgia Plantation Slave Food, uh, this is titled Georgia Plantation Slave Fruit Rations, okay? Slaves were required, and I quote, slaves were required to prepare their own meals three times a day, okay? The master did not give them much of a variety of food, but allowed each family to raise well, that's that right there. That's a misquote to about raising their own vegetation. They weren't allowed to raise their own vegetation until later. Let me tell you, but check out what they were giving them, though. Each family was given a handout of bacon and meal on Saturdays through the week. Corn, ash, uh, and, um, basically, uh, or pork. So they were uh, on Saturdays, they got, he said, was it each allowed a family to raise, excuse me, uh, each family was given a handout of bacon. And, and meal, cornmeal. So this is what they were given. You had some plantations that gave out. Now, I read an, I read a book where some slaves, uh, they would get like 8 to 10 pounds of pork for the month and a few potatoes. And they had to make that last. You know, a mother had to make, or a mother and a father or a mother had to make that last until they, until they got another ration of pork, you know, and potatoes. But eventually they realized they were not going to get much work out of the slave by giving them such a bad diet. And this is where they started allowing the slave to grow their own vegetation. Okay. Um, let me read this right here. It's called the Gardening for Slaves. This is taken from an article called Gardening for Slaves. It says, what we find growing in a slave garden, beans, field peas, black eyed peas, squash, greens, such as collards and cabbage. Um, uh, onions, potatoes, yams, along with peanuts, gourds, making 
uh, uh, <laughs> wow. This is all indigenous people. This is all indigenous. This was the common things that you saw in a slave's garden. Beans, peas, black eyed peas, squash, greens such as collard greens and cabbage, potatoes and onions, yams, gourds, some fruit, apples, uh, melons, watermelons, when I say melons, and there was even some livestock, mostly uh, some had chickens. You know, they allowed some, some some masters allowed them slave allowed their slaves to have a couple of chickens to uh, you know raise their own chickens. So, but looking at the fact of what they ate, this is the type of diet that the indigenous people had. Uh, well, again, the three sisters. The three sisters consist of what? Squash, beans, and corn. I'm reading right here. It says that the common thing that the slave grew in their in their little garden was beans, peas, black eyed peas, and squash and greens. Okay? So, you know, and I'm pretty sure, you know, if they if it was a corn plantation, they had corn. If it wasn't a corn plantation, then they didn't have corn. If it was a plantation that grew tobacco or or a plantation that grew um, um, uh, that cultivated sugar or cotton. Well, they didn't, you know, so they didn't have corn, so they didn't give them corn, but they, you know, they allowed them to grow what they could grow. And if they could get some corn, I'm pretty sure they grew some corn too. Okay. Um, here we go. I got another one I want to read. Now, now let me read this right here. Okay. Going into what makes soul food, because soul food is indigenous food, people. Again, soul food is is indigenous food people i would challenge anybody to go look up the indigenous cherokee dishes and you're gonna find black eyed peas you're gonna find red beans and rice you're gonna find corn you're gonna find squash you're gonna find hot water cornbread you're gonna find cornbread you're gonna find johnny cakes you're gonna find come on now okay i'm looking at right now a list of so-called soul food okay and looking at, well, like I say, what was poisonous to our people? What was poisonous to our people was not what our people was growing. It was the meat that was given to them. And also what was given to them as a means of frying their own meat. Because our people, Indian people, have been deep frying and frying food for thousands of years. Barbecuing, deep frying, and frying food is nothing new to indigenous people. Okay? So our ancestors were doing something that they always have known about. Just like the vegetation that they were growing. Collard greens and beans and black eyed peas and squash. That's all indigenous people. They knew that. They knew what they were doing. Okay? But the white man, the Europeans, who kept our people on plantations, gave our people the number one poisonous thing or the number one poisonous ingredient to their indigenous cooking. Pork. Pork, people. Pork, which is a, which is a very tox, toxic meat. High in sodium. High in sodium. The meat itself is the highest, has the highest content of sodium of any meat. But it has a, a, a trick worm in it. You feel me? So this was something that they gave our people. This was a common place to give slaves the leftovers of the pig. I mean, myself, me, myself. I grew up as a kid. I ate chitlins. Mom, you know, because my grandmother, be the fact that she's from Shreveport, Louisiana, this was a common thing in my family. Every year, my mom and her sisters would get together during the holidays, and they would clean chitlins. You feel me? Had that big old ham, honey-glazed ham sitting on the table. Nothing but deaf people. That stuff is not made for indigenous people to eat. It is not made for indigenous people to eat. That was That's a European food. Okay, so, like I said... I'm looking at right here. This is um, uh, uh, under gardening, the uh, the slave garden. What they normally grew was a common thing that slaves grew was beans, uh, field peas, black eyed peas, squash, greens, and collard greens, and cabbage, onions, potatoes, and yams. You feel me? And at some time they had, they had a few chickens as livestock. Okay. But what I also want to read, I want to read right here, because one of the first people that brought uh, pigs to America was Hernando de Soto 
who settled who settled the Florida Keys in, in the 1530s. So let me read this right quick, okay? Um, this is uh, it says as at Queen Isabella Ilib- uh, at Queen Isabella's insistence, Christopher Columbus took eight pigs. Christopher Columbus, y'all, took eight pigs on his voyage to Cuba in 1493. They were they were tough and could survive the voyage with it with minimal care. They supplied an emergency food source if needed, and those that escaped provided meat for the hunting on return trips. But Hernando de Soto was the true father of the American pork industry. He brought America's first 13 pigs to Tampa Bay, Florida, in 1539. As the herds grew, explorers used the pigs not for eating as fresh meat, but for salt pork and preserved pork. Did you hear that? As the herds grew, this man brought 13 pigs to the Americas in 1539. Check this out. As the herds grew, explorers used the pigs not only for eating as fresh meat, but for salt pork and preserved pork. American Indians were reportedly so fond of the taste of pork that attacks to acquire it acquire it resulted in some of the worst assaults on the expedition. By the time De Soto died three years later, his original herd of 13 pigs had grown to 700, a, a very conservative estimate. This number does not include the pigs eaten by his troops, those that escaped and became wild pigs, the ancestors of today's um, fair, um, excuse me, the ancestors of today's feral pigs and those given to the American Indian to keep peace the pork industry in America had begun. So I found, this is an article that I found, and I was like shocked at that, what I just read. I mean, Hernando de Soto brought 13 pigs. Now, if I, when I read this article, and I didn't read the whole, the whole information, I just read a paragraph, but it says that when he got there, he opened the, uh, the doors of his, uh, you know, the doors of his ship, letting the pigs out. And he let 13 pigs out into the wild purposely. He let 13, and then for the purpose of giving his men something to hunt. But those same pigs grew into 700 pigs years later. And they was roaming around of America. Pigs are not native to America, people. Pigs are not native to North America, nor are they native to South America. Pigs were domesticated by Europeans and brought here. And it is not something that indigenous aborigines our ancestors were not accustomed to eating until Europeans brought them here. So, again, um, I got another article I want to read right here called Native American Foods, History, Culture, and Influence on Modern Diets. Check this out. And it goes like this. It was not long until the new foods from the Americas were introduced around the world and corn and potatoes, new varieties of beans and squashes, peppers and tomatoes, and many other foods were rapidly accepted into the cuisine of the entire world. Did you hear that, people? Did you hear that? Our potatoes, tomatoes, we introduced that to the world. It was not long until the new foods from the Americas were introduced around the world, from corn, potatoes, to new varieties of beans and squash, peppers and tomatoes, and many other foods were rapidly accepted into the cuisine of the entire world. Now, approximately 60% of the food consumed worldwide originated from the New World America. Did you hear that, people? 60% of the food that's consumed around the world originated right here in North America. Our ancestors cultivated it. Our ancestors grew it and they mastered the cultivation and farming of agricultural food. The question is, what happened? I'm going to tell you what happened, people. What happened? Teaching our people to eat like Europeans. Starting on the plantation. Huh? Our people ate healthy. They grew healthy food. They knew how to cook food healthy. But what did they incorporate into their diet that was devastating to the indigenous people, and which is still devastating to our people today? Pork. I'm going to tell you, 
Black and brown, so-called black and brown people eat more pork today than white people do today. I want you to know years ago, it was the other way around. Years ago, from the time of European contact through the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, white people ate more pork and they ate more beef than so-called black and brown people. But somewhere down the line between the 1960s and the 1970s and the 1980s, they reversed it. They reversed that by making pig and pork more accessible, by making it cheaper and more easier to buy by the poor, for poor people. They still kind of made beef still expensive. They still made beef accessible by giving uh, black and brown so-called, again, so-called, because black is not an ethnicity brown is not an ethnicity so when i see when i use these terms black and brown i'm using it as a metaphoric reference because i know you guys can relate to it but so-called so-called black and brown people at one time beef was not easily accessible for black and brown people poor black and brown people to act to get because it was too expensive but they made that more accessible why what taking the leftovers of the cow, grinding it up and giving it to them in, in a form of what is called hamburger, which is also not the left, just the leftovers of the cow, but hamburger also is the leftovers of pig. Most so-called black folks, most so-called brown people don't even know that hamburger has also pork in it. It's leftovers from the cow and the pig. That's why it's called ham burger. That's why when you go into a store, then now they tell you if it's 100% beef or if it's 98% beef or if it's 97% beef or if it's 96% beef or if it's 70% beef or if it's 60% beef. Because I want you to know, people, customarily, the butchering industry in America, when it came to getting ham burger, you got, a, you got exactly that. You got ham burger. You got ham and cow leftovers ground together and sold as cheap ground beef in the store. And guess who was buying it? So-called black and brown people was buying it up. Because it's beef. All they see is it says beef, it ground beef. And they, that's what they want, hamburger. So they were still eating pork, as well as all the pork byproducts that this country still put in food under other names. So people, we got to change the way we eat. Our people did not eat unhealthy on the plantation. They were given foods that was unhealthy that they that was that were additives that was added to their diet like pork like salt pork like bacon you feel me like the leftovers from the cow the cow tongue you feel me so people our people may do with what they had they did the best they did the best that they could with what they had now when you look at actually when you look at the list of what what is called soul food when you look at on the list what's good and what's bad, I'm looking at a list right now, you see, because I, I I mean I grew up on soul food. I grew up on black eyed peas and I just last I made me some collard greens last night. And I you know I, I'm gonna tell you there's a healthy way of making soul food. Cause soul food is something that our indigenous ancestors have always made. They've always made black eyed peas and rice. Our people have always made red beans and rice. That's nothing new to our indigenous woodland indigenous ancestors. They've always made collard greens and mustard greens and turnip greens. Just like you know, the, the but the what what but what made that what made healthy wholesome food bad was the additive of salt pork. The additive of ham hocks, the additive of pig's feet, the additive of, of, of uh, neck bones. You know, sometimes neck bones are beef neck bones, but sometimes neck bones a lot of times was pork neck bones because pork neck bones were cheaper. So I'm looking at it right now, and when it comes to soul food, okay, the core of what makes soul food what it is, black eyed peas. I'm looking at it right now, black eyed peas, collard greens. You feel me? Uh, mustard greens, you feel me? Sweet potatoes, turnips, do you feel me? These things are healthy. There's nothing wrong with it. Okra, nothing wrong with it. These are healthy vegetables. You feel me? And, and chicken, I mean, well, our people, when it comes to what our indigenous ancestors ate when it came to meat, well, chicken was nothing new. I mean, pheasant, deer, but the thing about it, our people did not eat a whole lot of meat. 
meat was something to compensate, but it was not the main course. The main course was always vegetables. You feel me? Collard greens and, and beans and squash was always the main course. So uh, uh, when it comes to desserts, you know, uh, sweet potato pie, uh, uh, pecan pie, these are things, are, there's nothing, our, 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 people, our ancestors have always made things like this. Hush puppies, you feel me? Johnny cakes, huh? Grits, cornbread. This is all indigenous. What's not indigenous is the pig. What's not indigenous is oxtail. What's not indigenous is 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 is, is all the any part any part of a pig in your diet. That's not indigenous. White men white men brought that over here and gave that to our people and then forced it on our people on the plantation. Okay? Um fat back. Come on, man. That's death. Fat back. What is fat back? Fat back is uh is is pork fat. That's cured, salted, and uh, you know, and 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 fried. They you know they fried, they fried, fried. That, that's it's pork. It's basically it's pork fat, fr- por- fried pork fat. So people, we got to change the way we eat, and we, you know, one of the ways we can change the way we eat is that we need to start by just the little things that we can change. You know, in my family, you know, my, you know, my, my three, I got three young sons. My three son, young sons have never drank cow's milk. They didn't grow up on any, we didn't, we, cow's milk is not something that we use in my house. We use coconut milk. We use almond milk. You know, and that's what we drink. We drink almond milk and coconut milk. We don't drink cow's milk. Cow's milk is for cows. Cow's milk is not something that's indigenous to people people that's a european dish cows drinking cows milk is a, is a european dish and that was something that we've been adopted from our european oppressors to drink cows milk we need to cut off cows milk it's unhealthy and i'm you know what next week uh i'm gonna I'm I'm do a show i'm gonna bring in some of the information on about why what's totally hazardous to your health cows milk cows milk is just as hazardous to your health as pork Pork is worse though, but cow's milk is just as, is practically just as hazardous to your health. We got to get our people off the cow's milk. We got to get our people off the of, uh, off the processed sugars and stop eating so many processed foods. And in some cases, cut the processed foods out altogether, which is I know it's virtually possible. It, it appears to be virtually impossible living in a modern industrialized world where everything in the ki- in the in the uh, supermarket, almost everything in the supermarket is practically processed. Everything in the refrigerator section is processed. You feel me? So we got to start. We got to start making our own breads, making our own cookies, like our grandmas used to do. I do a lot of that myself. You know, my my wife and I, we do a little. We do that ourselves. Make our own cookies. You feel me? We got to start making our own breads and, and 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 you know, start stop buying so much processed foods from the store. But we, like I say, we can start by cutting off the milk. Get stop feeding milk to your children. Milk is bad. It's not good. It's not good for you, at least for indigenous people. White people can drink milk all day long. They've been drinking milk for, for, for hundreds of years anyway, you know, so they can drink that milk. But look what happened to so-called, a.k.a. so-called black people, you know, the, pe- the people who have been falsely identified as black Americans. Later on, we become lactose intolerant. We end up having all types of uh, 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 um, respiratory issues and, and, and allergies. And I want you to know this is all due to the lifelong drinking of cow's milk. Again, this is from the lifelong drinking of cow's milk. The allergies, the phlegm, the constant fl- yearly phlegm that you're coughing up. This is from drinking cow's milk. So the number one thing we can do is get our families off of cow's milk, get our families off of eating so many processed food and try to cut processed food out altogether. You feel me? And lower our carb, our carb intake. Because indigenous people did not eat a whole lot of carbohydrates. They ate a lot of vegetables and they ate a lot of corn product, you know, cornbread, cornmeal, cornmeal mush, uh, you know, things of that nature. I grew up on that cornmeal mush, you know. Later on, replace with you know uh, cream of wheat. So I gotta go, people. I'm talking. I'm talking. I can talk about this all day long. I'm sitting here. I got some information right here. I wanted to read to you on Native American 
uh, food preparation. What how our people look. Let me read this right quick. Section four on food preparation on how our indigenous people did their food. Okay. It is important to keep in mind that, and this woman, this article I took this from. So let me let you know where I got this information from. This is from. Uh, I'm pulling it up right now so I can tell you what it is. My computer. Okay, Native American food, history, culture, and influence on modern diets. And this is from Science Direct. This is from Science Direct. Okay, let me read this right quick to you, my people. This is important information right here, okay? Food preparation by indigenous people. It is important to keep in mind that many Native Americans were largely hunter-gatherers until the Europeans arrived. Although many Native American tribes had well-developed agricultural had well developed agriculture they did not have domesticated animals and they that's not true they they did have domesticated some did have domesticated animals and they still depended on heavily on the wild plants and animals for food also an explorer by the name of james adair mentioned that the indians did not use any kind of milk did you hear me people let me read that again an explorer who lived amongst the Native Americans by the name of James Adair. His last name is capital A-D-A-I-R, James Adair, mentioned that the Indians did not use any kind of milk. He also stated that none of the Indians, however, ate any kind of raw salads. They reckoned such foods is only fit for brutes. Berries and fruits were eaten raw. But most of their foods were cooked. Did you hear that? Let me say it again. Berries and fruits were eaten raw, but most of most other foods were cooked. James Abdera was impressed with the culinary skill of Native American women. He and said, "It is surprising to see the great variety of dishes they can make out of wild flesh, corn, beans, peas, potatoes, pumpkins, dried fruits, herbs, and roots." They can they can diversify their courses as much as the English or perhaps French cooks and and either of the ways they dress their food. It is grateful to a wholesome stomach, meaning they cooked hella good. They cooked hella good. Let me go on to the next paragraph. Cooking methods included baking, frying, deep frying, boiling, roasting over an open fire. Corn was used in a variety of ways such as succotash was a simple corn and bean dish with almost ultimate variations a simple recipe is shown in recipe one okay let me go on down see they also let me see this was a wonderful food that could provide a balance of uh, balance meal along with corn and beans providing the complete protein corn was also cooked as a porridge known as uh, soft key or porridge by the, um, by the Seminole tribes in Florida, it was usually corn flour boiled in water. It could be eaten as a soup or drunk as a hot beverage. Cornbread was also a very common food among all Native Americans and could be, and could be uh, uh, eaten or could be flatbread such as tortillas or thick bread, more like modern cornbread or pancakes made of corn. Interesting, interestingly, all major varieties of corn, red, blue, white, and yellow, they are available today were, all, were, were already available to the Native Americans when the Europeans first arrived. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Again, it said, he said, all major, all major varieties of corn, red, blue, white, and yellow, that are available today were already available to the Native Americans when the Europeans first arrived in the New World. Another way of corn and beans were frequently combined was to make bean bread, which is a corn bread with beans. So again, people, our people knew how to cook. Our people knew how to cultivate their own food. I will read more of this next week. This article is very good article that talks about how our people ate, what they ate, and went into detail. I got more information here. I will share it next week. My podcast is actually over, but I know I can go on and on and on, but I got to end it. So, again, people, we got to change the way we eat. And I'm going to tell you, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. 
the slave on the plantation is the woodland aboriginal indian again the slave on the plantation is not an african very few africans were brought here if they were brought here at all but the majority and especially the women especially the women 80 to 90 percent of the people on every large plantation in america and medium large plantation were indigenous woodland aborigines you feel me and this is the reason why they grew the vegetation that they grew white folks in during slavery times didn't eat black eyed peas white folks didn't eat uh uh, uh you know um squash you feel me these are things that indigenous people have always eaten and you know what so-called aka black folks who are really indigenous native americans or indigenous aboriginals are still eating it today in the south north east and west of america you feel me people so we got to wake up we got to wake up to who we are and we got to wake up and realize who we are and we got to take back our culture we got to take back our our, our our identity and we got to teach it to our children you feel me and keep our ancestors alive keep their memories alive you feel me we can do it people so on that note i gotta go i would definitely be indigenous and i would definitely be back another indigenous sunday to share nothing but the raw and uncut here on the black village if you want to chime in it doesn't cost you a dime just a bit of your conscious time you can join me every sunday from three to four pacific standard time people at 857-232-0155 again that is 857 area code and 232-0155 and the conference key to get to the conference door to join me here at the conscious table of truth is 947595 again that's 947595 and on that note people i gotta go so join me next week to continue this subject matter of why we eat the way we do subtitle the plantation poisoning of a people i will continue this subject matter next week and as i always say may the great mother bring us together under the wings of her peace her love and her joy and as always i love chicken so love chicken peace and chicken grease i gotta go peeps i'm out Go cool, go cool. ASC got produce. ASC about to go cool. We gon' go cool, go cool. ASC got produce. ASC about to go cool. Women in the kitchen, women in the kitchen. Ooh. I be women in the kitchen, women in the kitchen. Ooh. Chop it up, chop it, chop it, chop it, chop it up. The slow food got you sloppy, bruh. So chop it, chop it, chop it, chop it up. I get the C for the oranges. I get the B for the broccoli. I get the A for the milk. I get my vitamins properly. My food be packed with the minerals. I hope you taking this literal. So when you 65 plus, you should be passing your physical. Try to tell them, try to tell them. But they did not believe me. All that sugar was sweet. Say I got diabetes. You better read your drink. This stuff is not what you think. Get you some water or something. I get it free from the sink. Keep it healthy, but still got that good taste. Got an appetite for flavor and an appetite for taste. If you need a couple corners, I can get you some help. And then I see you on the van. Cause you need some milk. Living your road with some big dreams. About to make it big on the big screen. Don't pay attention to that TV. So steak food ain't what you need. Come on the house, let us shop it up. That's been telling me it's made of popular. The youth that are drooping don't stop it. The youth that are drooping don't stop in us. But the health, well, social change, my fruits and veggies be off the chain. One real food for real people gonna break your bread. Cafe, room money, real money, that's all I need. Get the green, black clean. Wanna make a hundred meals, we don't cook the hundred meals, cause my people gotta eat. My people gotta eat. Go food. Go food. ASC got produce. ASC about to go cool, we gon' go food. ASC got produce. ASC about to go cool. Whipping in the kitchen, whipping in the kitchen. I be whipping in the kitchen, whipping in the kitchen. Chop it up, chop it, chop it, chop it, chop it up.
Them slow fools got you sloppy, bruh. So chop it, chop it, chop it, chop it up. Chop it up, chop it, chop it, chop it, chop it up. The slow fools got you sloppy, bruh. So chop it, chop it, chop it, chop it up. Chop it up. Chop it up. Chop it up.